Oh well. Um, Let's take the phrase, uh, I'm all right, Jack. When the Boltings first used it to now, what, what does that mean to you in terms of now? Well, at the time, I remember it was made as a film with Peter Sellers playing the trade unionist. Uh, it was uh, quite a good comedy and a bit, uh, a lot of truth in it, I think, which I discovered uh, recently by, um, in the last year, I haven't worked at anything specifically in normal career-wise and film-wise or theatre-wise, television-wise, but um, I went up to Scotland and did a documentary on uh, labour <laughs> disputes in uh, labour and management, which is the uh, really the major problem in the whole country today, I think. So it means something different to me now than it did five, seven years ago when I saw it. Can we go into the Fairfield thing a little bit? Can you tell me a little mm. bit about your experience in that one? Well, um, I'd never considered myself a particularly political uh, animal at all, or, uh, apart from what one had read, you know, in the, about the Russian Revolution and uh, uh, Sholokhov and Quiet Flows the Dawn, that sort of thing. But suddenly when I went up to... Um, Scotland to look at this Fairfield's experiment that uh, this uh, Scottish industrialist Ian Stewart is uh, doing, um, and we awakened all sorts of uh, dislikes and likes that had obviously been kind of dormant in me, uh, particularly against management, which um, throughout the whole of this, uh, my experience anyway since I left school, which was at 13, in this country, I have never found a particularly sympathetic or a really good functioning management in this country, in my experience. They are, as a rule, uh, too sort of greedy and don't put enough of what they take out back in, as it were. And that's what I found in the shipyard when I went up to Scotland. This was the ninth shipyard to close since the war, and nobody had any solution to the problem. It was uh, all ho held more or less and controlled by families. And um, this Fairfield's experiment was a new conception altogether, which was to take in uh, labor, trade unions, capitalists, all combined in a trinity, both uh, financially and morally uh, um, committed to this particular experiment, which has since 1965 it started. Now in two years it's proved itself a success, so much so that it's a blueprint now for the new consortium on the upper reaches of the Clyde. So um, that's what <laughs> I found up there. Now, in terms of what you found up there, was there a lot of... Um Where did the basic opposition come from? Did it come from to the to the concept of Fairfield, they come from management, from government, from from the working man, from the trade unions. How did it balance out? Um, oh, they had a lot of problems, understandably so, because you know it's renowned in uh, Hugh McDermott's books on John McLean, the Red Clyde side, about all the uh, terrible problems they've had in strikes and what have you. But um, the, the the basic problem is revenge which is the trade unionists who have fought so long to get some justification, some consideration, and they're not, they were not uh, impossible demands. But they've taken so long to get it, they're both running like a well-laid railway line. There's the management on one side and the labor trade unions on the other, and there's no chance of them meeting. Um, except on an experimental basis such as Stuart has conceived, which is an erasion of the um, lines of demarcation, particularly in unions. So um, they found that uh, the big problem is communication, which, you know, is, is not just in industry, it's in all social life, I think, you know, more or less all over the world. But, um, and if he could make this experiment work on Clyde's side, then it most certainly could work anywhere in the world. How, how does government come into this trilogy? Well, um, 
he had a uh, he when Stuart had the idea he wanted uh, he went to um, saw George Brown uh, here the, who's now the uh, Foreign Office and um, discussed it with him told him what the idea was and he being um, a socialist and, uh, and has a lot of sort of contact with the trade unions and the trade unionists then um, they said they would back it to a certain uh, point. They were all very, very wary of the demarcation lines because, um, you know, they fought so hard for their strength and their, their union, you know. Um, and then he ha then I had to go to the uh, capitalists and not just take get one but get two or three so that one wouldn't have another power in that field. And Isaac Wilson and Lord Thompson and uh, somebody else, I uh, can't remember who the other one was, put up money. And then uh, the trade unions uh, put up money. And now it's um, solvent and, um, you know, uh, will be in 1960, by 1968, had they not formed a consortium, would have been in, you know, very good profit for the first time. Now, in terms of what you were saying about I'd never found a, a decent functioning management since left school, uh, if we assume, and I think we can, that over the next few years, you're planning to go into management in what, for better, for want of a better phrase, I'll call the leisure industry. <laughs> How do you see good management functioning there? Well, um, there has to be, uh, as say, a, it's the the difference between professionalism and amateurism, in that um, the results, um, and to get the results, you require a responsibility. Um, if I can sort of refer back to uh, the trade unions, say, there are 600 trade unions in this country, which are far too many to deal with all these sort of problems because each one becomes fragmented and they're within themselves and, and in uh, one coming in support of the other, they uh, snowball into uh, a mess. It becomes impossible. The original pr complaint is lost sight of. So. Uh, um, a person gets into a trade and holds on to their trade union, their card, as it were, and not so much really interested in their own particular responsibility as uh, as themselves, as people, as what they want to develop and go further. They're very limited in their um, function as a worker or whatever you want to call it. I mean, bosses work too. And that's where the, um, you would have to get at people to be so sufficiently interested and responsible to um, make the whole, you know yourself, when you've worked on something where people are responsible and interested or exciting, you can work 18 hours a day. It's no great problem. I mean, there has to be a reason why that takes place. It's not because they're making so much money, because, you know, we've seen people who have got more money than anything else, and, you know, they're not the cats you want to paint. Yeah. Now, Cubby, Cubby Broccoli, one of your favorite people, t told me once that because the, the Bond films uh, were so successful and one was making one after another, that he was able to form, or they were able to form a crew, you may deny this, a crew in this country in which a lot of lines of demarcation had been broken down because everyone was involved. In a particular, and he said he had the, you know, a very good film crew in this country, which worked in all the Bond films. Well, I think he had uh, good crews. He had certainly good key people like uh, uh, Ted Moore, the cameraman, and Ken Adam, the set designer, and uh, Alina Sullivan, the wardrobe woman. But these are all responsible people who enjoy what they're doing. Um, if Broccoli wants to take the credit, well, you know, who am I to deny it to him? <laughs> These people have a sufficient talent on their own, or a responsibility. Okay, let's just take a color test now, and then we can take the lights off you for a minute, and you're going to have a situation, a tax situation, or anything that would cause you to leave Great Britain and live somewhere else, base yourself somewhere else. Um, it's a great problem here. Um, Milton Shulman actually raised it in the paper about a couple of weeks ago. I thought it was one of the few really intelligent articles that were coming out of the papers. Um, the envy I, tax. Uh, pardon? The envy tax. The envy the tax. Envy yes, it was a very, it was a very, very good and, and succinct piece. Um, I don't know. Um, perhaps if the government 
whichever one it would be, could be um, put in control of uh, the film industry itself or something that would uh, produce their own money-making films and uh, involve the actors or top directors who make a lot of money, um, it would certainly entice them to stay. I myself would, I mean, I, of all the places I've been in the world, I, don't, I wouldn't like to live anywhere else but here. You know, I can put up with English with an effort. But, uh, I mean, I'd rather live here than live in Scotland, say, you know. Um, convenience in the weather is just a bit better. But I like the whole system here. Although, you know, it's getting a bit dodgy. But uh, I think that probably in a, a year's time, we'll see a big, big change. Any idea what it's going to be? Well, um, when uh, Karl Marx was here, he said that he could live here only because uh, there would never be a revolution as such. And uh, I have a funny feeling that what we're going through now is an odd kind of revolution, and they're getting sort of the backs to the wall, and everybody's sick of trade unions and sick of strikes and sick of paying too much taxes, and the, everybody in the newspapers... Uh, they see everything that comes out has a, there seems to be an inverted joy in saying, well, 44 trains derailed today because of, the, or delayed today because of the frost, and we've got the biggest uh, foot and mouth disease ever in the history of Europe, and the taxis go up, and your gas goes up by 33 and a third, and, you know, with a bit of luck, there's going to be another devaluation, and it just seems to be all played on that line. Well, um, they're very stoical in this country, you know, and uh, they've done, stood up to all sorts of things. I mean, I mean, they even won the last war. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if I figured this out, actually. We seem to be all we're at the end of the queue for everything, but we won. So I think that they take so much, and then uh, it's starting to be felt around... Uh, there's a sort of feeling around of... Um, dissension that will uh, eventually become action. Uh, and I think probably the young people will do something in a way. I don't mean the sort of belting each other with daffodils and that sort of thing, but I mean, because uh, there's a lot of serious kids here. Uh, and I want to ask you about young people, because you came through the mill as a kid, leaving school at 13 and, and uh, being at sea and all that sort of thing. You had a rough time for a long time. How do you feel about all the attention being paid to kids now simply because they've become a kind of affluent society and so many people are, are just afraid of offending teenagers now? Uh, well, one of the reasons they're afraid to, to offend them is because they'll punch them back or kick them all over the place. I mean, God, they're pretty tough now. Uh, but the other, the other side of it, um, I don't... Um, the thing is that they are asking questions overtly and behaving overtly, which... Um, is you know like it's a great kickback to um, our whole. It's part of parcel of what I'm saying that I think the, there is this kind of revolution in this country, or evolutionary revolution, um, because they've had to take. I mean, their parents. I mean, I remember when a, a buff-coloured envelope arrived in the house. I mean, it could be one of four or five things, and they were all disastrous. I mean, it could be a bill that wasn't paid, or the gas, or it was your calling up papers, or it was tax that you hadn't paid, you know, I mean, something like that. So these, the OHMS letters were, you know, well, the, the kids today are, uh, are sort of, uh, are not about to accept that sort of fear. I don't know what they, what, don't know what they have in, to replace it with, because, you know, that's something else that they have to go through to, you know, in their own sort of way. But... Uh, did you ever live off the welfare estate? No, when I was invalided out the Navy at uh, 19 with the adrenal ulcers, I was 25% disabled, so they gave me nine shillings. If I'd lost both legs and both eyes or something, I would have had uh, uh, 25, four times that. That's two pound five. Jeez. That's a week. Something, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is another thing because of the time in, you know, in different, uh, um, the kid doesn't understand today. Like, uh, I'm not saying that one should always, you know, pander to them, but you find a man who's 
gone off because he got one of these buff coloured envelopes and had been through the, the march from Scotland down to London and things and got this, and a lot of it is fear anyway, and he gets this note and he's got to go to what so he would uh, go right away, never question it. I mean, very few would be, you know, conscientious objectors. And then he goes off there and he finds himself in Siam or somewhere and the railway out there and he comes back and he's a, a wreck and a mess. He's not fit for work. He's off four or five months a year and he brings up a family and the son starts challenging him, thinking, well, what sort of stupid ass are you that you should get yourself in such a state for £2.5 a week? Because it's a different time and that's something that we've not, so we don't seem to be geared to handle the changes in the time. And then the, the father thinks, well, he that, uh, doesn't just think, he knows he can't handle this, this kid because he sees things differently. But we do have some kids around now, don't we, who have reversed the process. In other words, they don't bother with the buff envelope, but they fill out a few forms, and they go down to the labor exchange every week, and they collect here, and they collect there. And they'll only take a job if it's for cash, and they'll only yeah. take it for a few hours. And they're sort of living on it. This, this can't be a terribly healthy thing. No, I know. But, I mean, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's the, it's the other side of the same thing. It's the futility of it, and 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 in turn becomes irresponsible. And, and the solution is, uh, most certainly, I think, a responsibility. I mean, another one of the problems of, of particularly of now, I was just watching the other night um, on the television, the satellite. When you suddenly see uh, the fighting for the world championship, which is a joke anyway, you know, without Cassius Clay, but. The, um, I'm sitting in the house in Putney, and uh, I can't remember what time it was, nine o'clock, and there on the television is Louisville, and a fight going on, and as it's happening, and uh, this applies to all other events throughout the world. Therefore, one is being fed things all the time, and you're not you're not prepared. Uh, one has never moved at the same pace. Phys physiologically, to comprehend or do anything about it. It's like an overfed computer with all the wrong stuff. Coming into us. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, nobody's there saying, just a minute, you know, you've got to put two new bulbs in and three new so-and-so as to make it beep, beep, beep and come out with the right thing. This must raise a problem in bringing up your own son. Have you, I, are you somebody who lives for the day? I know you, uh, like Albert Finney, you sort of take, uh, you're taking the year off to think, uh, in a way. But in terms of your son, do you plan? Um, I've got him into um, this school down the, ro down the road from where I have it's a Froebel school. It's a very um, kind of freewheeling and interesting and, and uh, keeps him alive to all sorts of things. Um, for example, I mean, I think that, that he now, at, uh, he's five in January, and his five years is much freer and has more expression and more of himself than ever I had in 10 years, in 15 years. I should think even in my, I'm what, 37 now, in my 37 years I haven't traveled all that much more than he has anyway, which is, you know. But where from there, I mean, how do you want him to grow up? What do you do about discipline, for example, yourself? He's at the school during the day, but at home, does it vary from what it's like at the school? Um, I don't know. Um, I, d um, I keep a uh, firm hand on certain things, like, you know, I, um, he seems, he, what I like is a, a, as a balance of uh, overt behavior, shouting, what have you, and a, and a bit of uh, control as well. And that's, and he seems to have that, not just because he's my son, but he seems to have that, which um, I find, through me, seems to be all right. I mean, when he gets bigger, and <laughs> I'll just have to keep in shape. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hold that reel there. And I'd like to do one more if I could. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially juvenile delinquent kids or kids who've fallen off the rails for some reason. Lay it to the fact that parents haven't had enough time. No matter what school is done, the parents haven't had enough time for the kids. And hence you get your, uh, your kid trying LSD, mm -hmm. trying it, you know, without having in any way beforehand been advised by parents, or in fact, if the parents are too strict, going directly against it. Have you sort of planned things so you're going to be able to spend some time with your kids in the future? Mm. And how do you spend that time when you're with them? Well, I, um, this last year, because I haven't um, worked 
I spent quite a bit of time, you know, with them, relatively. Uh, when I was away filming, because I did a lot of work over about a four or five year period, um, I always took them with me on location for a part of the time, at least. Not at the beginning, because then, you know, I'm impossible with anybody anyway, so it would be a mistake then. Was it good for them or bad for them on the whole? Oh, I think it's good for them. I mean, uh, um, for example, I, uh, my, uh, you cannot, you, the only um, gauge one has is yourself and what you went through or what you didn't go through. I mean, for example, in my own uh, childhood, my father uh, went to work at 9 in the morning and came back at 9 or 10 at night every day except Sunday. Therefore, uh, Saturday finished at 1, then Saturday afternoon we got the football match to get some air because where he worked was Naptha on the rubber mill. And Sunday he spent in bed so that he'd be fit for Monday. Uh, so he didn't spend a great deal of time uh, with me. My mother worked as well. So that set the pattern for me. So I went to work when I was nine. You know, so, so I mean, I'm aware of uh, and uh, that side of it. So it, it took a bit of um, realizing on my, my part to, uh, because that, that was the norm for me. I never thought that you had to have any uh, sort, of, sort of exchange or sort of rapport with children, but this sort of, I realized that you do. <laughs> There's a funny sort of thing going on now, though, where people, now you talk about coming out of the Navy with ulcers at 18 and a half or 19, and uh, people are dying like flies with coronaries, and people are getting ulcers. But this father of yours who worked in Naphtha and had to stay all Sunday in bed to be fit to go back and work, he's still alive. Yeah. And in fact, your grandfather's still alive, isn't that right? Yeah. Well, how, you know, how is it? It doesn't seem to make sense in terms of all we've got going for us now. Uh, well, I, th well um, I think it's a different uh, gauge of um, living, too. You know, I mean, the thing is, is it's determined up there where they were. I mean, like my grandfather still lives with my, uh, now lives with my, my grandfather and grandmother are still alive and they live with my mother and father in Edinburgh. But I remember my great grandfather very well, who used to go for runs at 80, and he's 90 something, when he died. Um, but because uh, the sort of, um, it's something to do with the extremity <laughs> in the far north, I think, that, uh, that determines everything. You know, it's the weather and the economics. And then you start talking about people. Weather, economics, and then people. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the score. And the, the weather, weather and the economics are both bad, aren't they? Well, well for, for, for the majority, yeah. I mean, every time anything happens in this country, it affects Scotland most and Wales second, and then England. And well, a bit of Ireland, too. I know you're not particularly interested in politics, but how do you feel about the Scottish Nationalist Party? Oh, I think it's anything that um, provokes um, discussion about Scotland and the situation there that will get through some of that sort of granite um, is good. It can't do any harm at all. In actual fact, this week I was setting up Ian Stewart to see Winifred Ewing. <laughs> We had her in a week or two ago. She was very much on the defensive, I thought. <laughs> she was? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, she's, it's, a, it's an external place. It's, I mean, it's a it's place of extremes. What you was know. her phrase about we had to control our own... Destiny? And purse. It was purse? It was purse and policy. Purse and policies, well, and she, that's put what I'm she said it twice, and she put purse first both times. Yeah, well, I mean, that's excluding the sort of weather, and then you talk about economics. I mean, the, you know, but I mean, uh, what, probably I th should say economics come first, and then the weather, because um, if you can handle your economics, you can put up with the weather. I mean, mm -hmm. the, all the marches that started from up there, and, and you know, there's got to be a reason why, and all, and, and so many people leave the place. I mean, one of, one of the things I'm trying to set up now, which hasn't been sort of released at all, um, is a golf pro-am in Scotland. And um, I want to um, put it on a level with like what Bing Crosby does in America. But I want 
the money all to stay in Scotland. And I want all the money to go to St. Andrews University. And I want the golf tournament to take place in St. Andrews. And the money to go into research as to why so many good, clever, talented people leave Scotland. Well, you're on record now as saying, I'd rather live here than anywhere else in the world. I'd rather live here than Scotland. Well, I mean, I have, uh, I left Scotland for, you know, um, half a dozen reasons. And uh, I have to work from here. What I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I might well go back to Scotland, but I'd be living in a different way from what it was when I left to come here. Yeah, but my, my, what I'm really getting at is if, if you've got all this research going at St. Andrews and it turned up Sean Connery left Scotland because of A, B, C, D, E, and F, and now we can solve A, B, C, D, and F, is Sean Connery going to go back to live in Scotland? Well, <laughs> I raised this point. You, you, um, well, a mutual friend of ours, Stanley Mann, was at the house, and Ian Stewart was there, and we're talking, and I was saying, this is what I want the program to, t to put the scholarships in for. And Stanley Mann says, why? <laughs> <laughs> What's important about Scotland? And then, you know, and I say, well, uh, well, it's just wrong. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's kind of a sort of a, a blind allegiance or, or what. But I mean, it, there is something wrong. And you think it could probably be solved by a Scottish Nationalist Party cutting through red tape to the extent that more personal interest will be taken in Scotland? Well, this is, it's, it's such a paradox, and it's, it's, it's sort of, such a schizophrenic place. I mean, they have, there's a terrific um, sense of uh, worthiness and knowledge and learning in Scotland. I mean, they have these they have marvelous um, universities and uh, colleges and the doctors they produce, enough doctors for the whole of Europe. You know, and there's all this goes on. There's, um, seems to be a great wealth of drive in the people, you know? But it seems to be such a lack of genuine joy, and there's so much violence. Yeah, you were telling me about the Rangers, I'll take that. Well, I mean, that's, that's only, you know, uh, I mean, they're talking now about all the football problems down here being ordered off and everything. <laughs> We've been out of that for years in Scotland, <laughs> and we think that's part of the game. But isn't it, isn't it possible that that is it the function of Scotland to bring out this drive in people and the violence in people and then send them out for the, to the rest of the world? And that if you suddenly made Scotland sort of self-sufficient in a sense, they'd lose the drive. Well, maybe that's what we should do. We should get everybody out of Scotland and all these cats that are not quite sure which direction to take, we should move them up there <laughs> and shove them in the situation and let them sort it out for themselves. I wonder how many would survive. It's a very good thought, isn't it? Do you think you have to see the world to know the world? Uh, no. No. I think you can learn as much in the gorbals as you can traveling around. Yes, because everybody's world is themselves anyway. They carry it with them. I mean, it takes you years going to different countries and things, and you still, unless you, once you strike a certain, note somewhere, then you respond to it. But if you don't strike that note, you can go right through the whole country and, and nothing. All right, let's cut that there. That's fine. It's under the lights long enough. That's marvelous stuff. That's great. I was reading a thing at Chesterton not too long ago about...